Hey, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the session. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer and we can do our teaching. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much once again for this wonderful time you've given us to learn and study together, Lord. And even as we consider your feet, oh God, I pray that your word will minister to each one of us, Lord, to bear fruit in our lives. I pray, God, that you would give us the wisdom, spirit of knowledge and understanding, uh, Lord, to rest upon us, Lord. Uh, and we pray, God, that uh, you will continue to speak in and through us, Lord. We submit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, last class we did up to chapter 21, right? So we looked at... Uh, proclaiming the uncompromised gospel and how uh, chapter 19 proclaiming the uncompromised gospel with power so we looked at a few points there uh, proclaim the full gospel that is preach teach um, follow it up with signs wonders and miracles and even as we do that we must uh, be obedient to god trust god to you know work bringing signs wonders and miracles Right, then Paul reasoned and he demonstrated also. So we looked at the examples here at uh, uh, Paphos, at Thessalonica, at Berea, at Athens, uh, Corinth, Ephesus. What did he do? He went, he sat with the people, he reasoned with them. He tried to understand their belief. He tried to understand what they believe, believe in, what they are going through, their culture, everything. So he reasoned with them. And when he reasoned with them, he he understood their mindset and he was able to effectively present the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? He was relevant. He was uh, he was relevant to the people, to the culture, to the setting that he was in. He was addressing the minds of the people, and he also followed that up with supernatural work. Right. Then we also looked at how. You and I, as leaders, are called to break controlling powers. Now, we know that the devil has his own kingdom, his own authorities. He has his own dominion. Uh, uh, and and uh, he has his demons that are working in, in this world uh, um, and different kinds of controlling powers that he has. Uh, but remember that we talked about this last class, that the cross destroyed the work of the devil he nullified the power of the devil so what the devil is doing now is he's using his power he's using his demons and uh, these evil spirits to entice us away from god to to make us you know we know the scripture says the enemy comes but to kill steal and destroy that's all he wants to do and so we looked at some of the examples philip's preaching uh, uh, of the gospel set those people in Samaria free, even uh, Simon the sorcerer, Paul and Barnabas preached and demonstrated the gospel and the person who was, uh, you know, uh, uh, demonstrating or practicing sorcery, he was again, uh, the power of that sorcery was broken. Uh, Paul was ministering in Philippi where the slave girl was, uh, was there, uh, the spirit of Python, there again he broke the controlling powers there uh, when paul was in ephesus again ephesus was known for its gods and goddesses a place where there was uh, the entire place was gripped with uh, demonic work right immorality sexual immorality idol worship uh, but when paul went there he was able to uh, you know nullify and break these power centers as we could say uh, and eventually planted a church there, right? So uh, even as we go about planting churches, uh, these are certain aspects that we must always remember, right? That we proclaim the gospel, proclaim it with power and authority. And we also looked at chapter 20, equipping the saints. Now uh, there comes a time when as a church, you have come to a stage, finish your pioneering stage, you've gone up your administrative stage, now uh, there are the, the, you finish and then you get into a stage where you're building, you're equipping people uh, for the ministry. So it's no longer just giving, uh, but it's also 
appointing and sending out, right? You're equipping people. And uh, when we are equipping people, a few pointers to remember, teach God's word, emphasize the supernatural, equip people to uh, be the salt and light wherever they are, equip God's people for evangelism, lifestyle evangelism, equip, empower, and send them, right? Uh, uh, let's go to the next portion, the personal life of a church planter. Now, we talked a little bit about it in the initial chapter, but this is a very important aspect right, of ministry. Uh, you know, always remember that ministry is God's call for our life, but our priority must first be our relationship with God. And out of that relationship with God flows everything else. And right? so our personal life is our, our personal life, our relationship with God is number one priority when it comes to ministry. Because there can be a time when we are doing ministry and things are set in motion. Right? Okay, conference, these are the things that need to be done. Right? Bible college, okay, these are the things that can be done. Church. Uh, Sunday services, church teams, uh, uh, all, all that happens within our uh, life groups. Everything is happening. We, the wheels are in motion. And it's very easy for us to, you know, to put aside that time, that relationship with God, and look at ministry. It's very easy to put ministry first and then God. That's not what God wants. Our call, our, our call is important, but our relationship with God is number one. So how do I recognize whether I'm called to be a pioneer or whether I'm called to serve under a ministry? Right. Now, we're going to learn this in this chapter. Now, we must always understand first, there's a call of God in our life. And when God has called us, we must follow that call, right? So the question is whether it's to be a pioneer or, uh, you know, to serve in the local church. Now, the answer is we must position ourselves to serve within an existing ministry. Right? And if God calls you to plant a church, pioneer the church, you should go about doing it, right? But always remember, the call of God first. So, for example, you're called to be a pastor. You know it, right? So, it'll be good for you to serve under a church and serve there, learn, grow, develop yourself. Right now, I'm not saying this is you must do, but it's a good thing to do. Right? Probably you can take two or three years, and then uh, at the right time, you can ask God. And the, God, and the Lord can just release you to start your own ministry, pioneer your own entirely, right? So here is a few pointers that we could consider uh, when it comes to pioneering, right? pioneering a ministry or a church. Number one, a pioneering spirit. That is the ability to try something new or to pave a way to try something that may not have been attempted, uh, attempted and to be adventurous. Now, if you are, you know, always remember, pioneering is, is a bold ask. It's not something very simple. It's, it's God expects us to step out onto the waters, not knowing what is ahead. So this pioneering, so now we're looking at church. So the ability to try something new, to pave a new way, right? So pioneering can happen also within a local church, and we'll talk about that later, right? Within a local church, you can pioneer different ministries. But if you feel that you have this in you, okay, I'd like to try new things, or I'd like to pave a way, or to try something that has never been done before, meaning I don't just be in the status quo, but attempt new things. 
we can always look at that as an indicator that God is calling you to be a pioneer. A second indicator of grace for uh, when it comes to a pioneer is the ability to work independently. Right. So, for example, um, you're able to, you know, so for example, there's a task that is given to you. And this task takes two weeks. Right. Now, you're able to complete the task before two weeks independently. Right. It's not like you're saying, okay, this other person is doing the other half, and you give another half to another person, they both put it together, and the task is done. No. Uh, the ability to work independently, a leader, an uh, initiator, right? Uh, not just being a good worker or a follower, but you know, just able to come up with strategies, ideas to fulfill a task independently. This could be an indicator that you know, I, I, uh, maybe God is calling me for to be a pioneer, right? Uh, ability to build bridges, which means reach and engage with people from different backgrounds and cultures. Now remember, uh, if, if you're starting a ministry as a pastor or as a minister of God, we need to be able to develop the ability to speak to people from varied audiences. You'll have a corporate coming and talking to you. You'll have a housewife coming and talking to you. So we must be able to balance that out. Right, the ability to build bridges between them both. What you talk to a corporate person who's a person who's working in the corporate sector for 20 years is not the same thing you'd be able to talk to a housewife who's you know basically looking after the house. Or you're not going to talk to a, a housewife, what you're going to talk to a housewife is not what you're going to talk to a youth or a teen. Right. So we, have, we must be able to build bridges, engage with people. They must feel that, okay, as a leader, I can go to him. I can go to her. I'm sure I will get something. You know, the Lord will speak through him or her. And, uh, and uh, as a leader, you're, you're able to differentiate these backgrounds, yet you're able to build those bridges. You're able to... Uh, you know, bring all of them together and say, hey, we are different culturally and we are different in our backgrounds and cultures, everything, but we are one, able to build bridges. And this is a powerful uh, gift that God gives to an entrepreneur but, or to a pioneer. It's a powerful gift. It's not easy to do, but it must be done. Because we know the church, uh, remember the Apostle Paul, he says, uh, uh, you know, to the church in Corinth, also to the church in Ephesus, uh, there are people who are Jews, there are people who are Gentiles. So he, say, he says, to the Jew, I'll be a Jew, to the Gentile, I'll be a Gentile. But then he was able to build the bridges together. It's not like Paul only spoke to the Gentiles, he's also speaking to the Jews. Right? Uh, in, in very uh, in Ephesus, there were Jews, right? Uh -huh. So, able to build bridges. Next point is very important to be a visionary. What is the word visionary? I love this word. A visionary is the is a person who has the ability to see something when it does not exist, right? You you, you see it in your mind's eye. It's wonderful to have that. A pioneer must be a visionary. So, for example, God is saying, I want you to be a, I'm going to choose you and you're going to use you as a worship leader. And you're going to sing songs. So, you feel that's a vision, that's, a, that's what God is calling you to be. This is an example, right? If that's a vision. So, you as you must be a visionary. Okay, God, I want to see myself one day writing my own, writing songs. The songs, coming up with melody for those songs, recording those songs, 
releasing those songs, the songs touching people's lives worldwide. You see it, but right now you're only in your room writing. Nobody knows. Right? And that too, you've not even finished one song. It's okay. Right? You're right. Be a visionary. When it comes to church, you may have 10 people sitting in the church. You know, you tell your church, hey, one day we're going to be 50 people here. One day we're going to be 100 people. One day we're going to be 500, 1,000, 2,000. You build a vision. You, you see, you be a visionary. Right? Now, vision without work is of no use. Right? We can have many, if we keep having the vision, we don't do anything about it. It's of no use. Right? So also, when it being a visionary is, is the ability to see something which does not even exist. I see a church with 5,000 people. Right now, there may be 50 people. But your heart is so stirred that you know that one day we're going to see this. I see my church reaching out to different nations. Right now, it's reaching out only to your area, not even the city. But the visionary sees way beyond. It doesn't exist, but they see it. That's why I love Ephesians 3.20, and I keep saying it to myself. What is Ephesians 3.20? Now to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask, think, or imagine by the power of his Holy Spirit that works through us. A visionary sees beyond what what is what is happening right now another indicator for a pioneer is prior history in engaging in church plants uh, so somewhere you have engaged in church plants and i can also say cell groups starting up cell groups or starting up uh, youth teams but right? something small it could be something really small, youth team. So, uh, starting up life groups, cell groups, right? Um, and then you build from there. And then maybe you have uh, some history before in your life. You have helped. You know, you know, maybe you were in a church planting team, and you've served. And and uh, after the church planting team, you were able to establish a church, and the church is going on well now. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a church that has been established, then you have some experience, then you can also say, hey, God can be calling me towards this pioneering gift because I worked before in that area. Right? So maybe five of them were in the church planning team in another city. You were there, you were engaging in that. Now the church has been established. So you have some experience. So God can use that experience to help you be a pioneer. Right? A stirring in your heart. This is the most, I would say, the most powerful uh, indicator for a pioneer. A stirring in your heart. Right? Um, the Holy Spirit stirs your heart so much, you know that this is what God wants you to do. Remember Moses? Right? What happened? He said, I, I have to. You know, he knew that God had called him, but he made a mistake. Forty years later, at the burning bush, he saw the burning bush. There was a stirring. Moses, when when he was forty years old, they saw he saw his people being persecuted and beaten. There was a stirring in his heart. Although he went about doing it the wrong way, but God used that stirring. It didn't go away. He knew that God had chosen him to be the prophet to bring the people out of bondage from Egypt into the promised land. Stirring in his heart. Can you believe this? 40 years later, that stirring may not have been there, but God, like, it was like, uh, it's a picture of the burning bush, like, it was like God saying, I'm going to stir up that, you know, what was there inside, that leadership skill, I'm going to stir it up. 40 years later. Nehemiah, Everyone were there, but only Nehemiah was stirred in the spirit. Many of them 
hundreds of people have heard about the walls that are broken and the gates have been burned down. Only Nehemiah was stirred. Because of that stirring, he took a step. And because of that step, he led the people to build the walls of Jerusalem. Did he have experience as an architect? No. Did he have experience in leadership? No. Did he have experience in building teams? No. Or everything he learned on the job. But he did it powerfully. Why? Because it was a stirring from God. It was a gift that God gave him. And people who listened to him, the people who caught that vision, you read the book of Nehemiah, how they caught the vision. It's really, you know, when you think of it, they were people who were working in the farms. They were, they were not builders. But they said, okay, he's just saying, am I saying, let's build the walls. Okay, let's go. They did it. They caught his vision in a way that they would go in the morning, work, they come back home, and they continue to build the wall. They no rest. They didn't say, oh, I'm tired the whole day I work. I can't do any more today. They did it because it was a vision which they had caught, stirring in the heart. So God can put a stirring in our heart. The stirring can be a mild one. It can be a strong stirring. Right? Uh, it's very important to hold on to those stirrings. Say, God, okay, tell me when to step up. Tell me when I can, when I can, when you want me to time. When do I take the step? You lead me, you guide me. Right? Sometimes it be like, stirring is like a tornado inside you, but outside you may look just calm, calm and pleasant on the outside, but inside you're stirring with so much that God wants to do. Be patient. Ask God for the right time. Step out at the right time in faith. Right. Seventh point, another indicator is a clear, confirmed word of direction from the Lord. Now, this is also a wonderful way, right? Imagine you, you know that God is calling you to pioneer a church, uh, but now you're working in the corporate sector, for example, right? You're working in the corporate sector. You know that God has called you to plant a church, pioneer a ministry, but it's not happened two, three days. I'm sorry, two, three years maybe. Right? So you're reading the word one day, and then suddenly you come to a passage that says, A big door I have opened for you. This is giving you an example. A big door I've opened for you. Jeremiah, in the book of Jeremiah, he says, Step, go into the land which I have told you. Right? All through the book of Isaiah, there are Wonderful passages. So God can speak through the words, a word of direction. Go, now is the time go. Right? Remember a friend of mine, uh, uh, a, a known person, you know, he had been waiting on God and when should I step out? When should I step out? So for many years he was waiting and one day he was reading the word and he came to this passage where it said that uh, Jesus stood up and left that place. And that word spoke into his heart so strongly. And he knew, okay, Jesus saying, get up and leave this place. And he knew that it was time for him to start his ministry. So the word can be something as simple as that. It can uh, really confirm or bring direction into our life. Right. Then you have the accidental church planter. Now, uh, it's important to note the hyphen there, accidental. You're not expecting this, but you find yourself with a baby in your hands. Uh, so pastors put the example of APC Nepali church. Uh, let me say, let me just share what happened in Nepali church. Right. So I may not get the years right, but I think it was early uh, APC started 2001, but I think it was 2002 when there were a few Nepalis who, uh, you know, who came up to a pastor and said, you know, we want to, uh, you know, come to church. We want to be part of church. Uh, uh, so he said, okay. And so there were already about 10, 12 of them 
in the Nepali, Nepali friends and all of them. And uh, usually, I think initially, they uh, later on, they met on Tuesdays, because Tuesdays were their day off. They, were, they used to work Monday to uh, all the other days. So, so what happened was, uh, also used to preach in English, and there were there was Nepali uh, translation. So uh, we didn't expect to start a Nepali church. It was always an English, uh, English church, and of, of course other languages also. But Nepali was not probably not in our mind, but uh, but it came, the door came, and eventually we started the Nepali church. The church grew. It grew up to 100, 200, I think about 250 people, or the pastors, leaders, Nepali. Eventually, you know, we appointed a Nepali pastor. And, uh, so it was an accidental church. It was not something that we met and planted. Uh, but they came and they said, We want to be part, we want to learn from you. We want to learn the word. Uh, there's no other place that we, you know, we find fellowship. Can we do this? So there will be times people will come. And say, uh, can, you know, uh, we want to be part of this, and uh, that's wonderful. But here's the important thing: pray and get a clear confirmation before proceeding. Why? Because now these baby churches, as so to speak, can come in, and if they're not aligned with, of course, they, we give them time to get aligned with the vision of the church and all that. But if if it's not something that God has directed, it can cause problems, right? It'll be very hard to, especially when you accept something like this, it'll be very hard to disengage. Because why? It's they're all believers, they're in church. So prayerfully do it. Think about what you're going to do. Is it something that God wants me to do? So somebody comes and says, come on, don't immediately say yes. Take time. Maybe you can take a week or however long you'd like, but spend time in God's presence. Ask God for direction. Ask God for wisdom. When, how to go about it. I'm sure the Lord will minister. But it's if the Lord is leading us towards it and says, okay, go for it, then it's, it's a beautiful, uh, it's a very good feeling, right? You already have people. And they want to learn the word, so all we have to do is be there to preach and teach. And they will just they'll be like a sponge just taking in everything. Because they they themselves have come. So that's that's a wonderful uh, uh, opportunity. And uh, uh, it's nice when these these things happen, uh, but again, be careful, pray and get confirmation. Uh, so these are a few indicators when it comes to uh, being a pioneer right uh, uh, now these are not the only indicators right there, there can be many other these are some of them right and let's look at wrong reasons to engage in a church plan okay Rosalind has a question uh, is it possible that we may miss the season like God spoke we did not obey because for some reasons like we are under a pastor for several years and the pastor did not release or advise us not to go. So in this case, can we miss our season? Right. So this is a good question. But Rosalind, see, God is beyond time and seasons. Right? God is beyond what one is. A, God has got a, a, a vision or, or, or a pioneering gift into your life. Right. Number one is, yes, we can miss it because of our own right now always look at the example of moses right he he knew that he's going to bring the people out of god has called him to do that but he did something wrong he had to run away and there was a 40 years delay right uh now it was not in god's design for him to be looking after sheep that's not his he was a pioneer, he was a prophet, right? But he was looking after not only his his, his uh, father in law sheep. He had nothing to, with him, right? So, but then God knows how to restore back seasons. He can restore us back. Yes, there are times we can miss it. Now, two reasons you have mentioned here, right? One reason is because we are uh, we have not obeyed. Yes. 
that can be one reason uh, you know maybe uh, fear of uh, how can i step out or what will people think right uh, or uh, how will it support me financially i've got a family to look after so all these are you know uh, general uh, and uh, general thoughts that may come up but if god has called us he will you know provide all of that but uh, yes disobedience could be one reason but if we pray and ask god god i know that you have the vision i have a feeling you know i sense that you know uh, i missed it and you told me the last time uh, i did not obey lord uh, forgive me and restore me back help me to be obedient to you uh, and the lord will definitely right use you right he will definitely fulfill the vision that he has he will open doors right uh, uh, look at all through the scriptures. We see that David, right, uh, yeah, even though he didn't miss his season, but uh, uh, he made many mistakes. Right? But God still used him. And look at in the New Testament, uh, the apostles. Right? Uh, God used them. The Lord Jesus. They made many mistakes, but the Lord Jesus used them. Now the second. Oh, the reason that you have given here is the pastor did not release or advise not to go. Now, this is a very sensitive uh, issue, right? And it's not just an issue that is happening uh, recently, but it's been happening for many years, right? Because especially, for example, there's a person who's been with the church for maybe many years, close to the pastor, and now all of a sudden he feels that he wants to start or not all of a sudden, but he feels that God has called him to start a church. Okay, number one, if the person is, knows that this is 100% sure, okay, God has told me to do this, obedience to God comes first. So what, what, what the best thing to do is to go speak to your pastor, tell them, this is what it is, and I will have to step out because this is what God is calling me to do. If the pastor says, no, you cannot, right, uh, you have to work here. Now, obedience to God or obedience to your leader, right? we'll have to choose. Right? Now, remember that when we make these choices, we don't, we're not in a place to, you know, uh, control other people's thoughts and emotions or reactions we can't control it. they may speak bad of us they may speak wrongly of us but remember that if god is called that is more important if you're stepping out obedience to god is number one but we must not have any hatred or any kind of anger or resentment against uh you know the pastor because he he or she may say things to us right so so be good to just go straight and tell the pastor if the pastor has not let you know he has not released you before and you feel you've missed your season just go back ask god god is it the right time if the lord says yes go ahead just go directly now one of the things that i have noticed is that many of us many of them as believers, they are afraid to go to the pastors and tell them that this is the vision that I have uh, and I want to, you know, pioneer. They're afraid to do that because for so many years they've been working under them. And sometimes they feel obligated to be there. And the pastors feel that these, these leaders must work only here and nowhere else. Right? So we need to come out of that mindset. We need to step out in boldness. It's okay. Uh, there are some pastors who will understand, there are some who will not understand. The worst priority is the ministry that God has called us. President, I hope that helped answer your question. Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Okay. okay, let's look at some of the wrong reasons to engage in a church plan. Oh, number one, doing this motivated by strife and competition. Just because this person said, you know, just because this my friend he said he's starting a church even i will start a church now make sure my church is better than his church competition it's not going to last something that is born of the flesh will only produce flesh people will come and sit right but there'll be no fruit 
when it comes to church, lives must be touched. And so don't do anything out of strife and competition. Ah, this is another reason. The wrong reason to engage in a church plan because other options in ministry did not work out. I actually wanted to be an evangelist or I actually wanted to be a teacher in a Bible college. But now, since all of that is not there, let me just start a church. No. And so yeah, these are wrong reasons. Three, doing this as a job. Oh, if I do this, I can. I, I know that uh, my needs are met. Uh, so it's a job. Uh, it's a wrong reason to, uh, to engage in the church plan. Of course, practically, we do need finances and all of that. But remember that God knows. Right. And even as you are preparing to pioneer a church, we looked at that uh, initially, right? We looked at how you need to prepare yourself financially, take time, take two, three years, uh, save up, save enough funds so that you can sustain your family and the church, at least for a year or more. Right. So don't look at it as a job or a way, a source of earning uh, more money. So that should not be the mindset at all. Right. Uh, and then another wrong reason was doing is doing this for personal reasons, uh, maybe to migrate to another city or another country for comfort, for st status. Right now, comfort could be oh no, nine to five. So I can I can go when I want, come when I want. It's okay. So it's, these are wrong reasons, right? Or, or I don't like this city, so I'll go to another city and uh, you know, plant a church. No. Rosalind, you have a hand up. You want to share something? Yeah, Pastor, I wanted to know that can we, because we are talking about pioneering. So, like, uh, suppose if we start a church, so can we use our type to, uh, like, uh, you know, to meet the expenses or whatever needs the church has, like, to start with, like, because it's, it's a startup. So can I use my type? Because maybe like i'll be i'm giving my tithe to some of the church all these years so like can i just uh, put my tithe into this church when i'm starting it like okay so now this is a uh, good question but rosa here's what i will share okay this is what i feel now as long as i'm connected to a local church right I have to be faithful to that local church, give one tenth of, and pay my tithes to the local church. That's what God has uh, said. That's what God has designed. Right now, if you feel that God is calling you to start your own ministry and you need those initial funds, right? Uh, I would suggest that you look at probably other ways to try and save up. Right. Whatever little you can also remember that God can bless you. because because God's design is when you're part of a local church, uh, you pay your tithes and your offerings, right? Uh, one tenth of it, right? And uh, this is what I believe, right? Uh, you can maybe check with others as well, uh, but that's what I believe. Uh, if part of the local church, you give to the local church and then you can take certain portions remember for god all he needs is five loaves of bread and two fish right so even if it's just very minimal amount and you know that's not going to help right it's okay right never despise small beginnings so you keep it aside you say okay this i would use when i start my own ministry right and you will see that you know, what does uh, the scriptures teach us you know, uh, it says that you be faithful in this, and I will open up the storehouses of heaven. Right. So, Rosalind, I completely understand what your your question, right? Because uh, many of them have asked this question: Can I take this and use it for uh, my ministry? But I feel that until you're planted in that local church, you're there. It'll be good to be faithful to that local church, and when God says okay now is the time to step out uh even if you have less funds remember that god will provide for you because of your faithfulness through all these years god will provide for for your for your own ministry so this is what i believe Rosalind. so uh, you can uh, 
Uh, you can also ask others or other leaders as well. You can ask, but uh, uh, this is something that is, this is good because uh, what I believe is even if you have a little, right? I know planting a church can involve a lot of money, uh, but whatever little this faithfulness that we have shown here, God will be faithful. He will bring people. Uh, and you know he will bring people who will support you he will open up the heavens he will he will just make a way for you so, so sometimes it's not only finances sometimes when you're starting a ministry you need people right? people who can support you moral strength right uh, moral support they need you need that also right so it's not only financial so yeah god will bring the right people who Okay, should I pioneer with an existing church ministry or should I do this independently? Now, it's always good to, you know, there are a lot of benefits pioneering within a ministry because you have leaders who can lead and guide you and say, okay, let's do this. Um, let's uh, try this way. And you have many inputs, many thoughts coming in. Uh, but when you step out on your own venture, um, you, you know, it's it's sometimes there's nobody to, give you advice and uh, there are situations here where you know uh, you have to make sure that you establish good uh, relationships with people can care and encourage and support you spiritually so here are a few advantages we'll quickly go through them uh, working with an existing ministry has several advantages right so for example you're in the church uh, you're working in the church and you want to start your own ministry. So maybe a counseling ministry within the church right? or a cat or a, uh, we, something that we have is called a catalyst where catalyst ministry, which goes into schools and uh, minister the gospel. So whatever ministry right, uh, you want to start. These are some of the advantages. You already have well-established, tried and proven strategies and methods. Right? Right. This is work, this is not work. Okay. So you have people around you who can help, right? You have a good support system to help you get started. So you you know, you have probably a team who'll say, hey, we'll be there for you. Uh, you know, if you want to start a college outreach, we come with the guitar. Imagine you're alone and you don't have a you don't know how to play the guitar, or you don't know how to sing, right? Uh, but if you have a team, uh, it's already there, it'll come. Able to it, you know, you're, you're just stepping out in faith, right? Uh, you you may be able to get like-minded people to form a part of a core team. So you so within the church itself, you know people already, um, probably two years, five years, ten years. You form a team and you say, hey, um, what do you think about this? You know, you know, how, how about we start a, a, a college or youth? Uh, outreach kind of a ministry right? you, you form a core team you may be able to provide ongoing resources uh, and spiritual oversight and support right so on an ongoing basis you have resources material spiritual oversight right? you have pastors leaders uh, you know encouraging you uh, exhorting you giving you ideas and strategies uh, and then there's also support and you may have a name that is recognized and respected, right? So, so uh, let me give you this example, right? Um, in the city of Mangalore, we went to a few colleges, right? And we wanted to ask them for uh, the opportunity to take that one hour. Usually, one hour a week is uh, scripture classes. So, we wanted to ask them, can we take value education or scripture classes? Uh, and I remember this so clearly, but we were only maybe 15, 20 people in church. And, uh, and when we went to this, uh, the principal of the college, he, he was speaking and he said, okay, which church are you from? And we were saying, uh, it's not to uh, brag about APC, but uh, I remember saying, I said, oh, we are from All People's Church. Uh, and he said, oh, I know All People's Church because in Bangalore, uh, you know, uh, we, we work with All People's Church. And, you know, they, they they were very helpful to us and they said some very good things about the church and immediately the principal said from next week you start 
He didn't ask us what you're going to teach, what is the material, nothing. He said, from next week you start. And not only for your degree college, but I'd also speak to the principal of the uh, 11th and 12th. We call it uh, PMC here in India. So the 11th and 12th, you can also go to that college. Uh, and you can also uh, teach there. Why? Because we were, we were recognized and we were, uh, as a church, we, we had a good name. We, they, were, they respected us. So they gave us so many open doors. Out of that came uh, Christmas carols and value education classes year after year. Uh, and, and from that, uh, we got opportunities in at least seven to eight colleges just through that one door. Right. So there are a lot of advantages that way. Yeah, and the last one may be able to help with transition and continuity, meaning to hand over uh, the ministry or the church plan. And right? we can hand over, okay, but when you feel that uh, your season in that place is over, you can always say, hey, uh, this is another team or this is another person who can take over and build on this ministry. Right? Uh, so here's the thing. There are a few cautionary points here. Do not join a Christian ministry to do a church plan because an opportunity exists. Don't join a ministry just to start a church because you know that you can start a church there. Right? Uh, that would be a wrong uh, intention to start. Right? Uh, some things to remember. Is there spiritual alignment? Right? So there are different denominations that we see. We have the uh, charismatic, Pentecostal, Baptist, also many denominations. So is there an alignment? Like imagine you get into, just an example, you get into the Pentecostal church. Say, hey, I want to start a church plant. And within the church, you start a church plant. And they say, actually, you know what? We don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Now, the Pentecostal church, they believe only, right? They are so strong on the gifts of the Spirit. Right? So we need to be 100% sure uh, is there alignment? Uh, is, is it uh, uh, is there any theological differences uh, is there 100 percent freedom to minister all of this needs to be uh, understood is there alignment of culture now for example there's a church and you go there you join the church and in this church boys and girls sit separately men and women also sit separately now suddenly you do a church plant all are sitting together it's going to raise questions Maybe something simple, but that's a culture. How come they are doing this? Right? Or, uh, or the main church, everyone take off the shoe, enter the church, but we are everyone are coming in the shoe. What's happening? There's a cultural difference. Uh, make sure that all of this is well thought of. Right? Is there freedom for God's grace and gifts to be released? Right? Uh, so you don't want to be in a place where you're controlled or you you feel that okay i can't flow in the gifts of the spirit because this church doesn't believe in the gifts of the spirit right uh, or i can't uh, release healing or talk about the supernatural because this church doesn't believe in that right? so then you'll understand that hey i shouldn't have done this i, I needed to always check make sure that what i'm doing is right right and then does the church christian ministry have a heart for the city uh, or the region where you have you feel called to plant a local church. So is there a long-time commitment? So for example, uh, you go to the church and you say, hey, I want to reach out to this part of the city. Uh, but do they have a heart for that? Or do they have, or it could be another city itself. So, but do the pioneers, the core team, do they have a heart for that place? And you may say, okay, start, and you start, and then over time, there's no commitment from there and there is no assistance, there is no help, there's no support. What happens? We feel rejected, we feel it down. Right? So another aspect to think of. And finally, does the Christian ministry have well-defined systems to provide support and assistance to those doing church planting? Right? So uh, one of the things that you can look out for is when you are, if you feel that you want to be part of a church and do a local church plan. Uh, 
do they have systems in place do they have a support system do they have a, a, a system system meaning assistance system uh, uh, in helping this church plant to grow uh, now i know that these are things that are quite new for us but uh, uh, you know when we learn to uh, you know walk in this understanding walk in that spirit of okay god i know but i also need to be cautious Right. And you know, I'm sure the Lord will correct us, lead us, He will lead us at the right path. Right. So we'll stop here. We'll pick up from uh, chapter 23 tomorrow. And you're almost coming to an end. So uh, yeah. right. thank you so much for joining this class. Have a great day ahead. I'll see you tomorrow. God bless. Thank you, Pastor.